it's been five years since uh, I addressed this subject with you. Uh, we've got some new people and we've got some failing memories. So uh, I'm going to try to run through the front end of this uh, rather quickly. And the meat, uh, we'll get into the meat uh, a little further down. But uh, 3D uh, actually today is more and more being referred to as additive manufacturing. Uh, it started uh, with uh, stereolithography uh, on one side and factory automation on the other. Uh, ba basically two uh, fundamental issues growing up together. And uh, Charles Hull uh, gets credit uh, universally for starting 3D. And I'll show you the difference here in a minute uh, between the stereolithography and the factory automation. But on the factory automation side, to the best of my knowledge, uh, Icon Corporation uh, was at the forefront of that, and that was 1983, just a wee bit before uh, Charles Hall. And then in, in 2002, an engineer from MIT Calling the name term 3D on the uh, processes. So that's uh, the beginning. Next slide. So uh, uh, 3D printing is really. Uh, has been described as 2D printing on 2D printing on 2D printing. In other words, it's 2D printing repeated uh, in a stack, and that makes 3D printing. Uh, we also have 4D printing, which I'll go to in a minute, and 5D printing which are modifications of 3D. So uh, you see that I described this as uh, 2D printing is X, Y, and Z. And when you go to 3D, you have Z1, which is the height of the product, or or Z2, you can have it either way you want. But Z2 is the up and down of the head. So uh, you have to move on the Z axis two different ways. One, you're moving the head that does dispenses the material. And two, you move the product itself. Next slide. So 4D printing is when the shape of a 3D printed object changes over time. It's referred to as 4D printing. Reversible 4D printing refers to the ability of the product to change back to the original 3D printed shape. And uh, if we've got a minute, can you bring that slide up? You see how that, that was produced flat and under, under an atmospheric condition, could be moisture, could be temperature. It takes a different shape. Go up again, keep going with us. Keep going. There now, right there. You see it with a pair of Pincers is being held perfectly straight. The side of this occurred and again it is a flat. Now, 
without going any further with the slides, uh, you, for example, can make uh, a, uh, an arm bracket and put it on a broken arm and it can actually, uh, under certain circumstances, can become tighter or become more rigid. So it has uses, uh, a wide range of uses, but uh, that's called 4D. 5D, I'm not even going to bother to try. So let's close this down, go to the next slide. All right, here's, here's the uh, one that how, here's the process. Uh, you see your tank, uh, it's that yellowish, yellowish tank, and there's a platform in it, and you can just see a part that's a darker or denser yellow. Uh, so that's a uh, resin. And above it is a laser beam uh, with a controller. And what happens in, in this version is that the, the scanner at the top is just going over the surface and solidifying the resin. And then the table will drop down a uh, millimeter and it will do another one. So it's, it is, the part itself is dropping with each layer is being solidified by the laser. Now that's, that's the process and I think that is the best process, but it is not the one that is most popular or that you normally see. Uh, one of the advantages of this is that it's the, the table can be moving very slowly and continuously. And so the product that comes out is smoother than it is when you put a layer on top of a layer. And the, the uh, more modern ones, which we'll get to, uh, are not with uh, laser, but with, with uh, uh, light source. And they will have multiple cameras uh, uh, setting, the, uh, setting the resin. But it's mostly used with resins, uh, although a similar process is used with, uh, with a laser with metal. So let's, next slide. So the first application and the one that really brought this to the forefront is rapid prototyping. So that means that somebody can get uh, a uh, potential order customer, they can actually make a prototype out of plastic, send it to the customer, customer okays it, uh, they can go ahead and, and uh, produce by any process, not necessarily 3D printing, by any process, machining uh, of any kind. Uh, that has pretty much matured and then these are the other applications. Uh, the next one that was uh, was molds and tooling. They use it to make a sand casting. Uh, then uh, in a digital manufacturing, and uh, now personal. Uh, and uh, uh, the digital manufacturing and the personal fabrication. Uh, 
are still wide open in terms of opportunities. Next slide. Uh, I describe this as having a four-legged four -legged stool. Uh, the first is the machinery. And as you'll see in a minute, the machinery today is very similar to the machinery uh, at, the, at the origin. The software has really advanced. I mean, it's some amazing stuff. Uh, it's, 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 uh, I hope it's not mature, it's not mature, but it's maturing and it is uh, uh, very complex. The material science is even more amazing. Uh, they are developing all kinds of new materials that they're able to uh, use in this process. And for applications, and we're just scratching the surface. Next slide. Uh, so <clears throat> the various processes we use, first is the stereolithography. That's kind of by itself. Uh, digital light is used in stereolithography. Uh, laser sintery, uh, centering, same. And then you get into the uh, factory automation side, uh, the extrusion process. Uh, that's the one that you see at your local library with a uh, strand of plastic running into it. Uh, in jet, fiber jetting, sterile jetting, uh, select the deposition, and electron beam melting. Next slide. Uh, digital light processing. This is very similar to what you saw uh, in the stereo, except that you have a light source and lens that sh shines through it from either the bottom or from the side. The uh, polymer is on a uh, the, uh, the pattern, uh, either material, either the material moves or the polymer moves. So if you have a fixed bed of polymer, then your product moves up and down on your Z axis, that's your Z2. Uh, next. Hey, George, can I go to what yeah. uh, uh, slideshow mode so that the, uh, the slides are enlarged, or do you need to see the uh, text on the bottom? I do not. Uh, no, you can go to the other mode. Oh. Uh, if we get to a slide where you need to test st the stuff on the bottom, I'll just change back. Okay, fair enough. There we go. I hope that helps everybody. All right. This is the laser me melding. This is the same thing, except we're using powder. Uh, and uh, uh, we have a video of this. If you, uh, we have a video. <laughs> we have a video of this one. Is it, uh, have I got it identified? I do not. Uh, I don't see it here. Well, yeah, you do. Whoops. Yeah, there it is. Which one did you want? Uh, no, we want about Okay. Whoops. Bear with me, folks. No, 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 no sorry. Bottom one. Oh. 
Uh, no, I'll skip it. Okay. What happens? What happens here is the powder is is uh, in a bin, and each time that, uh, in this case, uh, they show in a cup, so that's probably a ceramic. But the powder is pushed across the top of the product, uh, and the the uh, laser. Uh, melts it, then it drops down a millimeter, and the machine pushes another layer of powder across the top, levels it again. The laser uh, cuts the next layer, it drops down, and so the uh, the from the picture you're looking at. The cup on the left is the product. It's dropping with each pass. And you can see how time consuming that is. Because it drops, you, you spread the powder across the top, the laser melts, the laser melts it, uh, <clears throat> drops down, you have to push another layer of material powder across the top. Next slide. Now this is uh, <laughs> not quite the, uh, the the picture I might draw myself, but the model here is uh, looks like an elephant's head. But you see a filament that's fed through the extrusion head, and that's that somehow is heated and melted, and then it has to it has to set, so it depends on the material, whether you have to cool it or whether, it, uh, uh, whether it's uh, okay or once it, uh, once it uh, hits its spot. Next slide. And then personal fabricating is the kind of stuff that uh, you buy your grandchild to play with, uh, that you use to make stuff. Uh, people are using it to do uh, gifts or, or uh, produce for a craft shop or something like this. It's early stage. It's thermoplastics or composites. Uh, it's most of it is there's a lot of open source software. Uh, there's a whole uh, craft family doing this. Uh, these machines uh, may be selling for three hundred dollars, and uh, the other ones that I showed you are selling for one hundred twenty to one hundred fifty thousand dollars. Next. Uh, now nah, that's the same thing uh, that we looked at next. Uh, this is ink inkjet. This is like the printer that uh, that you've got hooked up to your uh, computer. Uh, and uh, it's a question of what uh, material. Uh, I don't know any particular applications of this, but the head moves somehow. You dispense whether it's a liquid or a, a uh, typically a liquid. Uh, this might be something that you use. Uh, process that uh, not doesn't look like this, but the process that you use for producing artificial skin, and uh, we'll see some of that later in the uh, presentation. Next, 
this I have uh, uh, no idea where it's used or why, or whether uh, there are any practical applications. But this actually is cutting and uh, using, uh, it was originally developed to use paper. You take a sheet of paper, cut it to shape, uh, glue it on the one below it, and when you're done, you have a product uh, which is a shape that is uh, just a bunch of sheets of paper glued together. Now, that would be something you could use as uh, prototyping, but I, I've never seen it uh, run across it in any practical application. Uh, whether it's there or not, I can't answer. Next. Next. Uh, electron beam melding. Uh, this is a process that is used in uh, aircraft applications, but it has a, a fairly standard use in medical. And this is a process where they're making uh, artificial limbs and joints. And there is a video with this one, if you can. Uh, 16, yeah. Do I have a slide there? No, I don't see anything, George. Okay. Then this will show, this should show up in a different slide a little later on. But uh, the real, the real uh, uh, difference here is that rather than a laser, you're using an electron beam. And it's because of that, it's in a vacuum environment. So uh, the shape of the equipment is based on the ability to maintain a vacuum. Next. Okay, so uh, what are the, these are the key components. They're fast and, fast and accurate Cartesian robots. Now that's, that's the factory automation side. And, uh, and I already described the Z2. Uh, the, this, the software is very sophisticated. Basically, it, uh, they will scan an X-ray or a CT scan uh, or a CAD cam and, and slice it. In other words, there'll be there'll be uh, two or three hundred layers uh, of pictures that just keep taking a segment of the product, whether that's your uh, liver or whether it's a part out of an airplane or your uh, 1950 automobile. Uh, and uh, the growth and the sophistication of software just continues to make progress along with the progress you see with a smartphone or anything else. And uh, the ability now uh, they are actually taking pictures with, with uh, your smart smartphone uh, in India, and they put the product on a little table that they spin by hand, and they just keep turning it and taking pictures 
and then sending those pictures via the cell phone back to a provider who can then reproduce the item uh, from cell phone pictures. Uh, the materials, everything you can imagine. Uh, and uh, you have to be able to just deposit them somehow. So you can do that. The two most common ways are one to actually put it in a strand and uh, dispense the strand, or you can dispense a liquid, or with metal, put it around the powder, and then they mix various metals together to get new metals that provide different tensils or different uh, uh, things like rust or whatever you want to deal with, uh, metals that will be uh, acceptable to be put in a human body. Uh, so, so they are now uh, providing metals that are not are not and have not been available for a regular machining. Uh, and that includes human cells. Uh, you need a method of dispensing them, and you need uh, anyway. You need a method of curing them, uh, whether that's hair or UV light, hot irons, laser. But somehow you have to turn it. You have to be able to dispense it. Then you have to. It's almost instantly, uh, rapidly, uh, turn it to a solid form. Next. So, uh, on the uh, factory automation side, uh, I had the, uh, the uh, situation where I took over Icon Corporation in 1983, and uh, Icon had been uh, founded at MIT in 1964 by a graduate student, Gordon Beatty, who happens to live in Lexington. Uh, you may know him, he plays the uh, He's a tuba and the bicentennial band, and his wife started the uh, craft store, Crafty Yankee, uh, downtown. Uh, Gordon sold it, and uh, in uh, 1980, it went from 122 employees down to uh, eight or nine. Uh, 10, something like that, when I got involved. They were, their fundamental product were motion controllers for the motion industry. And uh, we had motion controllers, we had positioning tables. And uh, it was pretty clear that it wasn't going to go anywhere. So uh, after some Brief discussions. We decided that uh, oh the uh, and I tell you that that particular uh, point in time uh, we were going from power tubes to solid electronics, and the machine tool industry was the customer, and they all picked up their bags and moved to Italy. And uh, so there were no customers and there was no uh, current product. Uh, what we did decide 
that we could actually make a product because there was a need uh, in the electronics industry. And I had a little surprise for everybody because I was going to have, was going to have a visitor at our meeting and he happens to be on board here right now. His name is Doug Bittner. So uh, what happened was when we decided we wanted to have a machine, uh, that would require a mechanical engineer. And I happened to know a young lad who uh, had gone to school at MIT with my daughter, had done a little work for me uh, uh, summer, and I uh, had some experience at Northeastern. And uh, I offered him the opportunity, fresh out of school, to take a shot at uh, designing this machine. And he came on board right from graduation and in November uh, we put together we put together a uh, photo uh, design and uh, we'll get to that in a minute but he's on board uh, I want to tell you this because of the way in which this industry has evolved now Leo Gosso Join me later, but he's out of uh, deck and uh, general uh, and in material science. And Kilwin, who uh, happened to be on our board and is a material science from MIT. Uh, the rest of these are not uh, important. Next slide. So this is the machine that Doug designed. And we had a photograph. And we sent the photograph out with is anybody interested. And uh, the controller on the right is not what we had at the time. Uh, we had a much different version of a controller. But we had the good fortune that we were one of the very few people in the machine tool industry that had continuous contouring and the uh, electronic industry needed the contouring for the work they were doing. So uh, in November, we sent out a sales flyer and said that we could do continuous contouring for the electronics industry. And in January, we got our first order, and that was the beginning of continuous redispensing liquids. Uh, as far as I know, the first one doing 2D uh, work. And I think uh, the first machine went to IBM, but I'm not, I'm not positive on that. Uh, so uh, let's move on. Uh, one of the other, uh, one of the first items well, actually, the second item was solder paste. In this case, you could not dispense it because the uh, solder would all jam up and it required a valve. This is the first valve that would dispense solder paste. And uh, that was a result of the work that Andy Kulin set. Uh, uh, understood. And he's persuaded the solder paste manufacturers to change their manufacturing process so it could be dispensed. So, uh, next. 
a little later down the road. This is a solder, a real solder, going with microfilm. And uh, that's the first use of a heated uh, gas flame uh, in melting a metal, if you will. Uh, and so that's the progression and the kind of work that had to be done before between each application. Next. Uh, and uh, as I leave ICON, I call your attention to a young lady down there who's also with us today, came as a guest, and that's Barbara Coughlin, who, who uh, <clears throat> is a product of Lehigh, worked for uh, Ford Motor Company, uh, came here and took over the operations. Oh, she ran the, uh, at Ford, she made the uh, air, condition, air conditioners for all the, I think worldwide, but uh, she came and took over the uh, production applications and then uh, later also took over the financial. Uh, both were aboard, uh, Barbara and Doug. The, uh, <coughs> so the other market now, 3D out the 40 year history. Uh, the question is, where is it going? Uh, and uh, it seems to be slowing down a little in the last uh, two years. But it, does, it, it doesn't look like it's slowing to me. But the numbers are, are what we're looking at here. But uh, they are everywhere. I don't care what country on the globe, uh, North America, South America, East or West, every university, some, every university has a department working on this. They're all trying to patent every thought and idea they have. Uh, there are so many applications that it, it is being applied to. I get something, I get at least three uh, transmissions a week with new applications doing something different. Uh, so, uh, and uh, there are new people coming in. There's a fever out there. And they're, they're getting, forget the IPOs. Uh, they have uh, all kinds of investment money coming in. Uh, but also the, the all time huge players, General Electric, has established a, uh, uh, what would you, that's not a department, it's a, a business center uh, doing 3D printing. Bill Packard now has a uh, massive uh, operation going on on the, on the equipment, uh, all kinds of stuff. Next. Well, back up. So uh, we're sitting on a 24% growth rate. By 2024, you're talking $35 billion going into this business. And now that's last year alone, $1 billion invested. 
Uh, now, of that money, 30% of it is in the applications. 25% of it is in, is in printers, is in the hardware. 19% uh, on your manufacturing platforms, 13% on software. Uh, that's uh, that's uh, the selling of the software or leasing of the software. 9% uh, of material producers. Now that will reverse itself. Uh, someday there'll be the machines will be a smaller portion, and the material on the, those are the razor blades. Those are the blades, uh, and that will become bigger. And then four percent just miscellaneous stuff. Next. So funding, funding is increasing in China and Europe. From private investors, the EU. So, uh, so you've got uh, a lot, uh, a lot of interest in the space uh, uh, effort and in the uh, med medical technician. Area. That's what people are looking at coming forward. Next. You want to show this one, George? Yes. You may not stay with us, but let's take a look. All right, this is. Not yet. All right. What's that? All right. Uh, uh, let's let's pause. Let's 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 take let's take a short tour here. Uh, uh, stick with us when advance advance the uh, uh, this. Leave the screen. Yeah. All right. So, so these are just, um, uh, just go through these. Um, go ahead. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Uh, those are those are all kinds of product. So the one on the top is a shoe or sneaker. Uh, not sure what that next one is, but that's just uh, down here. You see the one that's uh, just sort of all open. And the next one is a house. Uh, all, they're just these are all the different kinds of. This isn't showing very well, so let's let's leave this. Back to the this this particular this is a magazine, and it's the kind of thing that's coming all the time. There are two or three of these. A new one was just established, and it's material on the industry. Um, a, a study on the, uh, like this one right there, is hardware sales. What are the hardware sales going to be? Uh, and they're projecting the growth pattern. Uh, those are the, the kinds of numbers that we just talked about a minute ago. And this gets into more detail, but uh, 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 
And you see in this particular one, it says that uh, from 2014 to 16, uh, this metal uh, machines were averaging uh, about 30% of the market. And then it uh, climbed up, but it, now it's dropping again. And uh, I think that will continue to drop as a share of the market, a share of the total dollars in the industry, but not necessarily a drop in the value of the money uh, because the uh, manufacturing, uh, if, if we can look at it, uh, for uh, finished product rather than for prototyping or other applications requires more machinery, more sophisticated machinery, and more expensive machinery. So it will be more machinery on the high end. And the, uh, the uh, personal market, I think, uh, A, the dollars are, are much smaller, but I think that would get saturated. All right. And uh, whereas the the larger end, like GE, for example, producing jet engines by 3D printing. Uh, that's, that requires some sophisticated equipment. Next, next slide. Um, All right, uh, we've talked about the materials. Uh, I've taught metals and plastics primarily, but uh, uh, they're doing ceramics, uh, glass, rubber, leather, stem cells, which is an interesting area. And even chocolate. Now, the, one of the interesting things to me is that the stereolithography, which has been not the main manufacturing sector, really has the potential to go a lot faster. So, when you get into production and you're reproducing a lot of the same items rather than different items. Uh, this becomes in, uh, if you can uh, uh, photo uh, a chip, uh, a source for a high output, uh, for example, making, making some of the products that uh, they're doing as we speak for uh, uh, The uh, material efficiency is significant. And <laughs> the, uh, I think, People tend, when they talk about this, they tend to overlook the fact that there is a terrific uh, savings in the amount of material. What I don't have a handle on is if I'm going to take a, a steel bar and turn it into powder, uh, how much that process costs versus how much I save by turning in the powder and making it rather than putting it on a milling machine and turning it into scrap material and sending it back to the new process. Uh, I think that gets to be a complicated calculation. But uh, certainly the customization uh, more and more applications uh, of 
of those bars where you have to machine ten different pieces that assemble it. Here you can do it with one pass and you have yourself a finished manifold or, or uh, other type of product that you could not produce any other way. Next. Hey, George, just a heads up for you. You're about mm -hmm. halfway through the slides, and we have about a half an hour left. Let's go. Uh, all right. We're good. So, uh, where are we going with this? The speeds have increased. Uh, they think with processing changes uh, that for some products they're able to get maybe 50 to 100 times more uh, than they have up till now. Um, they're making all kinds of things, including, including steaks and burgers made out of whatever you want to make them out of. And uh, metal products will overtake plastics and AI will be powering the new designs. Next. Uh, and the other thing is with the new software, uh, you could just order something from, from the uh, machine and uh, in this case make me a new pair of shoes eight and a half medium with load bearing for my weight weight uh the, the shoes that i have on uh, have soles that are built into the shoe they no longer have an inner uh, uh, platform and uh that's a problem for most, but they are making uh, shoes that have a uh, very more comfortable uh, position, and they're making it all as part of a shoe, uh, replacing, uh, really replacing an industry. Uh, there's an outfit out in Marlboro, uh, out of uh, by Worcester, that makes shoe soles ship them all over the world where they are turned into shoes. Now you, you have your 3D printer and uh, um, oh, forget the shoe guy in Germany is producing uh, athletic footwear with uh, 3D printing and has uh, different soles made for walking or racing, what have you, built right into the shoe. Next. Do we want to go here? Uh, no. Keep going. Uh, this is the prototyping kind of product was done for prototyping. Let's keep going. Uh, this is uh, used for molds and tooling. Uh, so this is samples that are made to design injection molding. Uh, that really uh, now rather than being uh, molds turned into, into machine tooling is being actually replaced by high production uh, 3D printers. Next. Next slide, George. Yeah. Um, this this just is all the different materials that are being used. Um, 
Let's keep going. Um, oh, this or not? No, this is this is uh, what, this is merely a printed uh, uh, version of all of its various materials, and you can go uh, into this website. Uh, you can you can uh, you can pick the hardness you want. You can pick the temperature you want. And it will tell you what materials are available to use in whatever kind of machine you have, whether it's a pump or a liquid or a solid. Next. Um, so I'm running out of time. Uh, uh, as I said, there's big advances in the software. Uh, try the first one. Uh, Sorry, my hold, uh, sit right there for a second. Uh, you see that little machine on the left? That's about the size of a machine that sits in every dentist's office today. They are, they are, they're not saturated yet, but uh, every active dentist has a machine about that size and they will scan your mouth and either make a, um, you know, one of these clear insets that go over your teeth when you're 14 years old to get them to grow in straight or to produce a uh, cap or to produce a cross tooth. And, uh, and all that comes out of that one machine and uh, it's in the dentist's office and the dentist runs it. There's a new fancy operator. Uh, and that really is uh, a superb application. Uh, that started 1992. We made the first machine for the dental offices at NYU, and that was to grind the tooth. Uh, and that was the beginning of the software to examine your mouth and do it. And Today, uh, that that uh, process is all of it being done by one machine that sits in every dentist's office. That's how that has changed that particular part of the dental market. Next. To answer uh, Bob Melanson's question, I have a crown in my mouth that was made on a 3D printer. Does it, uh, does it lower the price of the crown? Of course not. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I, I don't have that information, but I suspect it's the other. I suspect that it actually does lower the price. Um, on the medical side, uh, the, the uh, physicians uh, use this to make models to rehearse operations. So they have, this is the earliest application. Uh, they would uh, make a model and then they would use it to, to practice what they were going to do in the operation. Uh, the next step up was to do a prosthesis uh, and then joints. Uh, Barbara, who's listening in here uh, as a guest has a uh, knee right knee I believe with a uh, 3D printed uh, knee that was a copy of her original. Uh, they are producing, actively producing heart valves. So uh, <coughs> uh, 
and uh, they are doing their best to produce organs. Uh, do the first video. Okay. Let's see what we can do. Uh, wait a minute. Is that a video? Well, I'll do it anyway. No, it's not a video. We'll bring up. How did I What you, what you want to do, George? This top one, the, the uh, this one here. Severe, yes. There we go. Okay, go ahead. I'll run down. Keep going. Keep going. I don't know if that one. Back up. Back up a little. Uh, bring that bring that up full screen. Well anyway. I'm trying. Uh, don't worry about it. That is a handheld 3D dispenser. That is dispensing a liquid that is coming out as your uh, or as a uh, uh, artificial skin, liquid skin, going and the, the uh, physician dispenses that liquid over the top of a burn. Let's say you burn your arm. He takes your arm and he runs that over the top of the burn and puts the skin over the burn and that, uh, the carrier, uh, eventually uh, is absorbed by the body and the skin becomes your skin and that is burn repair. We don't know how to make the complete item. So what we what we can do is we can pr produce a matrix. So uh, basically, what we're doing is making a trellis, if you will, uh, of the uh, organ and, and a heart, a liver. And then they, the, uh, uh, they take your stem cells uh, under, under the age of 50. They'll take your, your stem cells and they will reproduce those uh, in a, I believe it's a bioreactor. And then what they do uh, is apply that to that matrix that has been 3D printed. And it takes about two weeks for that to convert itself into a live tissue. And I think I got that right. But that's a uh, that's a process in which which we only actually print the framework or the trellis or whatever you want the, how the, the matrix uh, and then and then nature uh, really uh, does the rest. Next slide. And this is just a, a micro photograph of, uh, of the cellular uh, body. The ones on the left are liver. Uh, they're both liver, but they're one's the native and one's the uh, uh, treated, the biopinic. 
Next. Uh, this is a, a bioprinter, uh, a little hard to see, but you see those, those uh, little syringes that are in this, uh, that, uh, they, that's where they put your, your uh, uh, material, your liquid. And uh, that's something that sits in a medical lab. Next. Um, I guess we'll learn more. So let's let's just uh, uh, go on. Uh, there. Next slide. Uh, that's your space station. Uh, they have uh, 3D printers up there. Uh, they can use it to to uh, produce a part uh, for that space station if they need to repair something, and they can get the prints uh, transmitted and turn it into a part. Uh, they have a blue sky up there. Yeah. <laughs> they can do research. They're doing research there where uh, there are uh, applications where they want zero gravity. Uh, they are learning uh, a great deal of, uh, about how uh, some of these uh, bio uh, operations uh, manifest themselves next. Uh, these are uh, magnets uh, where, they're, where they're able to use um, rare earth elements and uh, Turn them into super magnets. Next. Uh, without going into this, uh, uh, it's more on the material science. But uh, uh, the Orbex rocket engine is 100% uh, 3D manufactured. Uh, that's uh, both interesting and frightening, but uh, let's move on. I'm skipping. Uh, skip, skip, skip. Who makes Next slide, this? George. You... Next slide, George. Yes. Yeah, who makes Orbex? Or what, what is Orbex? Uh, I can't answer that question. Uh, housing. Uh, do that first one. We're, we're, we're out of time. Uh, may I make a suggestion? Uh, let me let me uh, skip. Let me skip this. Uh, let me skip this. Uh, go, go down, go down to the. Uh, I'll, I'll show these. It's not with George. I need to. What? Well, here we go. I can. I can go down now to the next one. Yeah. Let's 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 go down. Uh, let's go to the last two slides. I'm trying. All right, the last two slides. And that's 53 of 54. All right. Um, so, uh, show, show that first slide. 
while this is coming up, I sent George an article that I saw from the New Yorker this week that talks about uh, 3D printing and, and COVID. I don't know if this is related or not. Is that that one? Yeah, it's, it's, it's coming up. What's happening? Uh, what's happening with 3D printing is uh, is it's uh, going mainstream uh, all over the world. Uh, the the uh, the various countries do just what we want to do with COVID-19, all of a sudden you need to take care of yourself. You need to have access, it needs to be available, it needs to be affordable, uh, it needs to be timely. So you can repair an aircraft in South Africa by getting prints from Boeing in Seattle. So you have a, a 3D printer there doing metal so that you can service that aircraft. Uh, okay. Uh, th these are, is this a video or is this just, uh, yeah. Uh, okay. This, this so, is not a video, this is a, this is a picture. Uh, okay, just run through these. These are, these are products that are being produced on the fly for COVID-19. So, uh, uh, oh, the first one, uh, a local producer on the, on the uh, ventilators went and reproduced the, the ventilator, but then he got there's a patent on it, so he's been uh, put on the block for patent violation, and other people have come to his to his uh, aid. Uh, but uh, they are now finding other ways to do it. Here's the next one. Uh, this is a ventilator that's been there. You have the picture of the doll with the ventilator in the mouth. And the ventilator are the parts on the uh, on the side. George, I'm going to wrap up. I can't hear you and, and, and see what's going on. And we're sort of frozen here. At least let me thank George. And, and I apologize, as I uh, said in the beginning, this was an experiment. <laughs>